Good evening and welcome back for the latest edition of the Four Score Speaker Series. I'm Jamie Stout, the Director of Membership for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. As always, we are grateful for our members and volunteers for the continued support. And since then, we've been honored with scores of historians, authors, and historical interpreters over the past year. Tonight, you're in for an intriguing and educational discussion with our CEO, Aaron Carlson Mast, an associate and associate professor of American Studies at Christopher Newport University, Jonathan White. As always, we will entertain questions from the audience, so please type those below in the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as possible within the hour. So without any further ado, please help me welcome the Foundation's CEO, Aaron Carlson Mast. Thank you, Jamie. Tonight, we're delighted to be joined by Jonathan W. White. Dr. White is Associate Professor of American Studies at Christopher Newport University. He is author or editor of 12 books and more than 100 articles, essays, and reviews about the Civil War. His earlier book, Emancipation, the Union Army, and the Re-Election of Abraham Lincoln, was named a best book of 2014 by Civil War Monitor, was a finalist for both the Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize and the Jefferson Davis Prize, and won the Abraham Lincoln Institute's 2015 Book Prize. Midnight in America, Darkness, Sleep, and Dreams During the Civil War was named a best book of 2017 by Civil War Monitor. His book, Our Little Monitor, The Greatest Invention of the Civil War, co-authored by Anna Gibson Holloway, was a finalist for the Indie Book Awards and honorable mention for the John Lyman Book Award. And since then, he has published another book and has three more coming out later this year and early next year, which we'll dive into this evening as well. John is a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians and serves on the boards of directors of the Abraham Lincoln Institute, the Abraham Lincoln Association, and the Lincoln Forum. He also serves on the board of advisors of the John L. Now the Third Center for Civil War History at the University of Virginia, the Ford's Theater Advisory Council, and the editorial board of the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography. In 2019, he won the Outstanding Faculty Award of the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia, the highest award given to the faculty in the Commonwealth. John, it's a pleasure to have you here with us this evening. You're a prolific writer on the Civil War period in particular. Can you please tell us about what drew you to that period of American history? Sure. Well, I actually, I grew up in a farmhouse outside of Philadelphia. The house had been built in the 1720s and then was added on throughout the 19th century. And when I was a little kid, I used to go out into the woods and go digging and I would find all sorts of belt buckles and bottles and all sorts of things like that. I think that's really where my love of history came from. Excellent. Well, you know, so the Civil War is far from an obscure period in our past. Yeah. And yet there is so much misinformation about the period, as well as what led up to it and what transpired during Reconstruction and beyond. And there is, excitingly for all of us, also always so much more to uncover, um, you know, perspectives that enhance our understanding of the past. I noticed that a great deal of your work has seemed to focus on adding layers of perspective. For example, the first book you edited, A Philadelphia Perspective, The Civil War Diary of Sidney George Fisher, provides depth of perspectives from one individual, whereas two of your new books focus on letters from individuals. Mm -hmm. um, my work among the freedmen, and then to address you as my friend, African Americans Letters to Abraham Lincoln, which I believe you said were both expected to be published this October. In October, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And they're so primary source rich. Can you tell us what was missing from the conversation that you uncovered by working on those books in particular? That's a great question. Um, one of the things I love about being a historian is going into the archives and finding a source that you know hasn't been held for 150 years. And so in these cases, these are letters or diaries that I was able to find that gave perspectives on the Civil War that you know just weren't, I think, very widely known or widely appreciated. So um, the one that'll be coming out October 19th with UNC Press is a collection of 125 letters from African Americans to Lincoln. And most of these are personally handwritten. A few of them were public letters, but most of them are handwritten manuscripts. They're buried at the National Archives or the Library of Congress. 
only 14 of them have been published in full in the Freedmen and Southern Society Project. And so the rest of them are voices that have just been lost for 150 years. And one of the things that I think makes writing African-American history hard for the 19th century is that um, most African-Americans were illiterate at that time. I think the estimates are about five to 10% of slaves could read, fewer could write. And so to find letters that they're writing to the president gives a whole new perspective on their experiences and it gives it to them, it gives it to us in their own voices because so often black voices are mediated through white people who see them and say, well, this is what I heard and they write it down and it's often in dialect and it's probably caricatured a bit. So these letters are wonderful because they give us the actual voices of the people who were writing to Lincoln. And I think in the case of that book, it's incredible that for the first time, they felt like they had a president who was their president and they feel confident enough to write to Lincoln and say, here's what's going on in my life. What can you do about it? Can you help me out of this, this situation I'm in? And what did you learn from that that, um, that influenced Lincoln uh, in his thinking and his policy? Because we know that Lincoln you know, was a huge advocate for education, including mm -hmm. education of freedmen. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the that's one of the big themes that comes out of the letters is you have missionaries and Christian ministers who write to Lincoln and say, can you give us financial support so we can go to the South and establish schools? And in one case that comes to mind, they actually met with Lincoln, handed them the letter, and he said, this seems like a worthy object that I want to support. Um, you find other people who write to Lincoln because they're in difficult financial situations and they they need you know, it's a wife or a mother of a soldier who whose son or husband hasn't been paid. And so they write to him about that saying, we're starving, we're suffering, we have little kids at home, we can't eat. And so all of these different situations lead them to want to write to Lincoln and see what they what he can do for them. I think that's a good segue to talking about Lincoln and education because he was a pretty serious advocate for education um, and often referring to his own lack of formal schooling. Mm -hmm. uh, and while it was, I think, 30 years after Lincoln's assassination, it was many decades later, Herndon, William Herndon wrote um, that Lincoln frequently said that universal education should go along with and accompany the universal ballot in America, hmm. that it was, you know, this idea that the the type of government we had really, and, and the idea of free labor both required education um, and that universal education was really important um, to the life of the Republic. And you, uh, you co-edited a book back mm -hmm. in 2012 um, of essays, I believe, called Civic Education and the Future of American Citizenship. And while that's not a book on Lincoln, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that it's very relevant to the conversation we're having tonight because Clearly, it's a legacy topic um, of Lincoln. You know, you have the all the land grant colleges that we get through the Morrell Act. You have the education of freedmen. You have just his statements about how education is tied to everything. A lot has transpired since that book came out, John. Um, and the role of civic education is as big a topic today, um, because if citizens can't aren't don't understand civic education, how can they be engaged citizens? What encourages you? And what concerns you most about the state of civic education in this country today? And then I have a follow-up question that we got from a middle school special education teacher. So we'll be pivoting to that next. Oh, sure. Well, that book came out of a conference that we hosted at Christopher Newport University back in 2010 or 2011. And so we brought the speakers together and then they turned their their lectures into essays. And Lincoln actually does come up in the book a lot. A number of the authors and contributors quoted Lincoln because of how important education was to him. You know, for me, I think one of the, the big concerns is how do you get young people to understand and appreciate and be interested in history? And I think that that's one of the big struggles for our time is is getting elementary school kids and high school kids to want to go to historic sites, to want to go to museums, to want to read good books. I must, I've got two little girls, they're five and eight. We must have 150 kids books about history upstairs. <laughs> we covering everything from Jamestown up through uh, modern baseball and the civil rights movement, we, we yeah. have it all. Although I will say that the vast majority of the books are Lincoln. So I'm, <laughs> I'm all right there. 
Um, but for me, I want them to learn to appreciate history and and be interested in it. We watch Liberty's Kids, which I think is a great old, you know, it's from the 90s, or early 2000s, a PBS series. And this summer, we're going to go to Philadelphia, and hopefully Ben Franklin's print shop will be open and Betsy Ross's house. And my hope is that they'll develop this passion for history. Now, they don't have to pursue my footsteps and right. become a professor. And it might be better if they don't. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I do want them to have a good understanding because I think that one of the problems we have as a society today is we don't have a good understanding of history. And um, we really have lost a lot, I think, because of that. Yeah. Well, let's, let's stay in that lane right now because the first question we have um, is, and I'll, I'll read this directly. As a middle school special education teacher, I use storytelling as a vessel to teach history and get students involved and invested in the curriculum and their own learning. If you could change one thing about how teachers approach teaching Lincoln or the Civil War period in general, what would it be? And she mm -hmm. says, he or she says, let me be part of the generation of teachers that gets it right. Well, first, let me commend that teacher for using storytelling, because I think that's so important. And I'll just say something quickly about my approach to teaching. In my classes, so I'm in an American Studies program, and most of the students who walk into my class have never heard of American Studies before. And so they don't know what to expect. And on the first day of class, what most people, what most, most college professors do is they go over the syllabus and they say, here's what you're gonna have to do and introduce yourselves to me and then go home. And it's like 20 minutes and that's it. And I think that's such a lost opportunity. So every fall I teach a very large class between 50 and 100 students, which is large for my school. And uh, again, most of them are freshmen, they've never heard of American studies. And I go in on the first day of class, I don't introduce myself, I don't say hi, I just start lecturing. And I start with the birth of Abraham Lincoln and I bring him up to around the late 1830s, early 1840s, right, right around when he's meeting Mary Todd. And at the very end, it takes about 45 minutes and, and I cover everything. I cover his love life, his education, his river trips. I mean, I have it all. And after 45 minutes, I stop and I look at the class and I say, now you all are really confused right now because you have no idea why you walked into this class and you just heard a 45 minute lecture on the early life of Abraham Lincoln. And then I put up a slide of the Lincoln Memorial. And I say, most of you think about Lincoln, if you think about him at all, like this, this giant larger than life monument. He's not a real person to you, but what I wanted you to see in this is that he was a real person who lived life in ways that sometimes aren't so different from how we do. He had love and loss and heartache and lost a parent and you know all this stuff in his life. And I say, I brought you up to the point in his life where you're going to read a speech he gave on Jan in January of 1838. And then for the next class, they have to read the Lyceum Address. Oh. And I, I try to get them to realize, you know, it's not just a political speech, but it's a speech written by a guy in his late 20s who had just gone through some serious heartache. And yeah. I hope that that humanizes him telling the stories. And so to hear this middle school teacher talking about storytelling, I think that's the way to bring people in. Now, yeah. if I could you know, get people to think about Lincoln in one way uh, broadly, it would have to be with, I, I don't think people understand emancipation. Uh, and it's yeah. obviously a very controversial topic. And I actually, that was something I did a podcast uh, with folks at the Lincoln Cottage That's on right. two summers yeah. ago. Um, I, I, I think that the emancipation issue is so fraught over this debate over self-emancipation or great emancipator that we, we often in, in attempts to find complexity, we sometimes lose a sense of the complexity and also the bigger picture. So if I could change education in one way, it would be to make sure everyone really understood the story of emancipation, Lincoln's role in it, the slaves role in it, the army's role in it, and yeah. um, why the Emancipation Proclamation did what it did. Um, because I think that's one of the most mis misunderstood aspects of Lincoln's career. I agree with that. And I think that the Emancipation Proclamation itself makes for a good educational tool on civic engagement. Mm -hmm. This idea that it's like, yes, maybe it's in a, um, you know, you have these executive or military, you know, military orders, 
um, but that it is not one thing that creates change in a society, but that it's, you know, that there are roles that many, many different people play. Right. And what is the appropriate role for you as a citizen too? Yeah. Um, speaking of storytelling and, um, and my, my, you know, my former organization, President Lincoln's Cottage, I'm reminded of, um, you know, one of the things that prompted us to reach out to you to, to be a guest in one of our podcast episodes was in fact a question we got from, mm -hmm. I believe, a second grader on a tour, which is, you know, a lot in public history, we do focus a lot on good storytelling and, and dialogue in, um, you know, in our public programming. And I think those really great stories can prompt really interesting questions. Yeah. And it was a, it was a young girl who asked, how could Lincoln sleep if slavery was happening? And so naturally we had to reach out to a civil war dream expert, which is yeah. you, John, and you did write the book Midnight in America, um, which touches on, uh, you know, nighttime during the civil war dreams and, and different behavior there. What of Lincoln's sleeplessness and his dreams, some of which have been regarded as premonitions. Can you talk a little bit more um, about that? And as an aside, you know, uh, sometimes books will cause me to go back and reread or, or pick up another book. And so your book, Midnight in America, you know, I, I went back to that because I'm currently reading a book at Days Close, Night and Times Past, which looks at how darkness was sometimes treated as having its own cultural practice, its own norms, yeah. its own otherworldly perils pre-electricity. So in that context, talk to us about Lincoln at night and his dreams. Yeah, Lincoln um, Lincoln was something of a believer in dreams. He thought that there was something about them that had meaning. And I don't know that he always knew what if he could put his finger on what the meaning was, but he knew there was meaning in dreams. And so mm -hmm. um, there's one letter he, and, and I should say most of what we know about Lincoln's dreams comes from other people writing it down. But there are moments where he wrote about dreams. So there was one dream where, or one letter he sent to Mary Todd Lincoln, where he said, uh, put Tad's pistol away. I had an ugly dream about him. Yeah. And so, you know, we don't know what that dream was in that case, but we know that he had a bad dream about his son. He had already lost uh, two sons at that point. And so he wants the pistol put away so an accident doesn't happen. Lincoln yeah. has a couple very famous dreams. Some of them I believe are true. And some of them I think were made up after the fact. So the one that I think is true, um, Lincoln was standing on a ship and he was heading towards a shore, an unknown shore. And uh, he said that he had this dream before every major battle during the Civil War. So Bull Run, Gettysburg, Stones River, um, Wilmington, he has this dream and he wakes up and then there's a big battle. And we know about this dream because on the last day Lincoln was alive, April 14th, there was a cabinet meeting and Secretary of War Stanton was running late. And so while they're sitting around the table, Lincoln just starts talking and he says, I had this dream again last night. I was on the ship heading toward an unknown shore. And someone in his cabinet asks him, you know, tell more about the dream. And, you know, they don't really get into the meaning of it, except for Lincoln says that he thinks great news will come. Mm -hmm. And he hopes that it means good news will come from General Sherman's army going through North Carolina. Now, no one thought that much about that dream in that moment because Lincoln always told jokes and stories and, you know, that was just his way in meetings. But then, of course, he's shot that night and dies mm -hmm. the next morning. And then people remember, well, Lincoln had this dream where he was on a ship heading toward an unknown shore. And so they figure it had to be a premonition mm -hmm. or a prophetic dream of what was to happen that night. And the reason I think we can trust that dream is that four of the men who were in the room wrote it down or told someone about it who then wrote it down. Mm -hmm. Most people who cite it cite Gideon Wells's account of it from his diary, but three other people also wrote it down. What's interesting about it though, is in each of those four accounts, it has a different person asking Lincoln about the nature of the dream. You get the sense that in, it, as they're remembering it, they wanna be the one who asked Lincoln about the meaning of this incredible dream. But the dream evolves over time. So for Lincoln, 
it was a positive dream. He dreamt that something good was going to happen. He or he thought something good was going to happen. He thought good news could come from Sherman. But in the aftermath of the assassination, it bec it becomes reinterpreted and redescribed, and it becomes a terrible nightmare. And in fact, I'm sure most of the viewers have seen the Spielberg movie. It's one of the opening scenes, and the way that Daniel Day Lewis's character describes it is as a very frightening dream. And that's how it comes down to us today. Um, another dream that's attributed to Lincoln is of the White House funeral. And the story goes like this, that Lincoln had a dream that he was in the White House and he heard weeping and mourning and he starts walking through the corridors and the hallways and he doesn't see anyone. And then he gets to the East Room and there he sees a catafalque and it's being guarded by a soldier. And he goes up to the soldier and he says, who is dead in the White House? And the soldier says, the president, he's been shot by an assassin. And at that point, all of the mourners become visible and Lincoln wakes up and he's just really shocked by this. And he takes the Bible off of his, his nightstand and turns to a bunch of different passages and all of them have to do with, with dreams, prophetic dreams. And, um, and then 10 days later, Lincoln is killed. Now, this dream, I think, is a total fabrication. And I have not convinced all of my Lincoln scholar friends and biographers, they don't all believe me, but the first time it was written down was in the 1870s, right around Lincoln's birthday in 1874. And then it evolved over time. So my the earliest time I found it was in a Maryland newspaper. It then got published in a Pennsylvania newspaper in 1874. Then about six years later, it appeared in a magazine in Boston, a literary magazine, and it was embellished a little bit. And after that, it appeared in the newspapers again. And then Ward Hill Lamon read it, Lincoln's bodyguard. And Ward Hill Lamon is notoriously unreliable. And Lamon in 1887 took this story and then put himself into it. And then his daughter, when she published his recollections in 1893, put it in there and it just took off from there. And I, I you know, Dozens of major Lincoln books include this story. And in fact, it's even, I don't know if you remember the show Touched by an Angel. There's an entire episode of Touched by an Angel from the 1980s that is centered on this dream. But I think it's a fabrication. I think that someone thought this would be a really neat story. It got into a literary magazine. Ward Hill Lamon thought, hey, I would look really good in this story. And from there, the fiction becomes fact and it, it gets passed off as a real dream. But I don't think Lincoln had it. Well, and that's when maybe storytelling takes it too far. Maybe <laughs> as great as storytelling later. is for, for conveying and, and teaching history, we we'll want to make sure that the stories um, are corroborated and sound. But, you know, um, at, to that point, um, it still can tell us a lot about yeah. how 19th century Americans and 20th century and even 21st century Americans think about Lincoln that he really becomes this larger than life figure who is getting a prophetic sign that he will be killed. Yeah. How about um, some of the Civil War soldier dreams that you talk about in the book and the ones that maybe feel prophetic, um, even if they really are based in, in events that are happening, like battles or the Emancipation Proclamation? Yeah. So the I have a whole chapter on dreams of people who dreamt they would be killed in battle and then were. And in some in some ways, you know, and I, I quote a psychologist to this point in the book where he says, you know, in battle, lots of people are going to be having those dreams. So it would be a miracle if some of them didn't come true. And I, I think that may be what's going on there. But what's interesting about those dreams is, you know, most of us forget our dreams. I, I have no idea what I dreamed last night. And most of us, you know, a few minutes or an hour after we wake up have forgotten what we dream. In these cases, men woke up in the morning, they went and told a comrade, I'm going to be killed in battle last night. I know it because I dreamt it. And then they are. The comrades remember those dreams. And in fact, most of the ones I found in terms of dreams of the dying were men whose dream reports were recorded in regimental histories 20 or 30 or 40 years later. And I think what that says about those soldiers is there was meaning in their fighting. There was meaning in their sacrifice. They believed there was something above them superintending their lives and their deaths. And so while most of us forget our dreams later in the day, these dreams were remembered decades later. And that was a really incredible thing for me to kind of grapple with when thinking about the meaning of their dreams. 
The other ones that really stood out to me, most soldiers dreamt about home. They miss mm. their wives, they miss their children, they miss their parents. And so they have very vivid dreams of going home and hugging their wives or being with their kids. And we know now from modern sleep science that the more tired you are, the more vivid your dreams will be. And so these are guys who are just exhausted. And it's little wonder that their dreams would then feel very, very real to them. But they also had a lot of anxieties about their families at home. And it was incredible to me to find how many men dreamt that they went home and they saw their wives on their street and their wives would ignore them or tell them to get away. And then they would see their wives and their dreams going off with other men. And so they, they have real anxiety about whether or not their spouses are gonna be faithful. And it manifests itself in their dreams. Northern soldiers and Southern soldiers have these dreams about infidelity. But what's funny is sometimes they deal with them differently. So there was a, a Confederate soldier from Mississippi um, named James Hardy, I think his name was. And he dreamt that he went home and his wife was cheating on him with two men. And he followed her to a party and he took out a double barrel shotgun and he killed both the men. And then he grabbed a, a knife and he was gonna stab her and stab himself at the same time. And uh, he woke up like that was sort of the Southern honor response to dreaming of his wife being unfaithful. There was a, a Wisconsin soldier, by contrast, named Miles Butterfield. When he dreamt that he went home and his wife was cheating on him, he laid down on the train tracks in his dream to commit suicide because he just couldn't imagine being without his wife and, and her being with another man. And so they're all dreaming about infidelity. They deal with it in their dreams in different ways. Wow, that's incredible. What were, you know, in, in terms of thinking about night as just a very different time and place in some sense, what was the most surprising behavioral or cultural difference um, you came across uh, in researching that book about how behavior was different or, or what maybe social norms broke down um, at night? Yeah, you mentioned Roger Eckert's book, and yep. one of his big insights is that prior to nat uh, prior to modern lighting, people would go to bed earlier, they would wake up in the middle of the night, and then they would do something, and then they would go back to sleep, and they called it second sleep, mm -hmm. and um, and that our natural rhythms are actually more likely to be like that than to be go to bed, you know, sleep through the night, and wake up. The whole um, solid eight hours sort of yeah, you know, modern right. myth of solid eight hours. Yeah, 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 that's right. And, you know, Civil War soldiers, many if, if they were from a rural part of the country, they were not used to a lot of modern light or, you know, light pollution, as we would call it today. But when they get to their camps, there's light pollution, there's sound pollution. And so this is a new experience for them that they have not had if they've grown up way out in the woods or in a, a farm somewhere very isolated and so the noises and the animals and the comrades I mean you find them writing about snoring it's incredible <laughs> how you know being around so many men who are snoring they write it, it keeps them up and they write about it um, so that was one of the interesting things for me to find is that the sleeplessness that they faced was often from just being around so many men and, and animals. Yeah, yeah. We have um, two questions that go back to, um, to the subject of education. So I'm sure. going to divert us back there for a bit. One is um, from a guest who writes, our family are direct descendants of Dennis Hanks. Can you comment on how his tutoring helped Abraham Lincoln? That's a great question. So Dennis Hanks is uh, Lincoln's cousin who lives with him when um, when Lincoln is, I guess, I think he moved when, there when Lincoln was about seven or eight. Is that right? And, um, you know, I can't comment specifically on Hanks's tutoring of Lincoln. Um, what I can say is that Lincoln's education at that period was very meager. And Lincoln later around 1859 wrote a little biographical sketch where he said that, you know, he learned how to read and uh, write and do arithmetic to the rule of three. And he said, if anyone straggled into the neighborhood presuming to know Latin, he was looked upon as a wizard. And so, you know, that says a lot about Lincoln's very early education. Um, he only had about a year of formal schooling and the rest of it 
was really self-taught. One of the things I do when I, um, when I do that opening lecture on Lincoln's early life is uh, I show pages out of his copybook where mm -hmm. you can see Lincoln kind of teaching himself how to do math, division, multiplication, compound interest, all these different things. Um, and it's pretty remarkable to think about that with those, you know, so few resources and so little education, he was able to uh, become the great thinker and writer that he did. Mm. Uh, David Kent asked us, as a professor, you teach students who presumably are there to learn about history. How do you, although you commented that they don't all know exactly what they're getting into with American yeah. studies. How do you reach out to a broader public who don't know history, but who get their information from blogs or media that um, intentionally misrepresent history is what David asked. Well, David, good to see you. Although I don't see you, I guess, but yeah. thank you for the question. <laughs> He's um, there. Yeah, so for my, uh, the, in my classes in the fall, um, all the freshmen are put into class, so they don't get to pick their classes. And most of them are science. They're not interested in history at all. And I, what I do is I try to win them over and get them interested. I'll never forget a few years ago, I had a student, she started pre-med and she took my class and switched to American studies. And when I met her parents at graduation four years later, I said, I am so sorry for doing that <laughs> to her, but she's doing great now. She's, she's got a great job and doing fine. Um, but for me, it's, it's about trying to win them over to show them that they're interested. And I can say, I always loved history. I, again, I grew up in this house from the 1720s and I knew I loved history. But when I went to college, I, I started as a business major because I wanted to make a lot of money and I still would like to, I mean, I'm not against that. Um, but I, I took a history class as a freshman at Penn State and it was one of those 250 person classes. I sat in the front row every day and I could just see the passion in, in my professor and I loved it. And I, I just decided at that moment, I'm going to switch and do this. And I, I try to do that uh, for my students and, um, and try to get them to take another class. That's sort of my goal is to mm -hmm. always get them to take another class. In terms of reaching the public, um, it's hard, right? Because I forget what the quote is. There's a quote about, I, you know, a lie can go halfway around the world before the truth, you know, even starts or something like that. And, and that's the problem we wrestle with, with the internet is something just has to be on Twitter or Facebook or a website and, you know, it can go viral and it, may not be true and it's impossible to defeat that right because you know mm -hmm. as historians we write books that have limited readership or um it's impossible to uh to be able to counteract something that goes viral at the same time i think there's things that we can do um i try to write articles that are for a broader audience so i've written a number of things for smithsonian for the washington post new york times um i love to do podcasts and conversations like this. I teach classes for local retirees here in Newport News. And that's one of my favorite things to do, in part because the students love history or they're interested enough, and in part because there's no grading. And that's the best part about teaching is if there's no grading involved. Um, but I, those are the ways that I try to, to reach a broader audience. I'm, um, I'm on the I'm the vice chair of the Lincoln Forum, and um, I edit the Lincoln Forum Bulletin. And one of the things I'm doing, I'm going to start doing, and I started in our current issue, is I'm running book reviews of children's books. And my hope is that uh, you know the parents or the grandparents who are members of the Lincoln Forum who are really excited about the Civil War in Lincoln, who have grandkids who maybe don't care that much, maybe they'll see a book title and they'll say, oh, this would be worth me getting for, so in fact, I got an email from someone today thanking me for doing that, saying they're gonna get a book for their grandson. And mm -hmm. I think that's a great way to try to reach the public, right? Reach them when they're young, get catch that interest when they're young and hope that, um, you know, if we can get people reading good books. And I'll, I'll say this too, one of my favorite movies is National Treasure 2 <laughs> and, um, and National Treasure. And I know that they're not accurate, right? Um, one of the reasons I love these movies is because the historian gets the girl and you just don't see that every day. But the other reason I love these movies is I'll never forget when I was in graduate school, I was at the National Archives 
and a mother brought in her two kids and she said to one of the archivists, little Billy here, you know, saw national treasure and just insisted that we come to the National Archives when we were here on spring break. And I thought, wow, if a movie can get a 10 year old kid mm -hmm. to want to go to the National Archives on spring break, it's doing something that's good. And if it then gets that kid or that parent to read a book or to read a book to their kids, you know, the history and national treasure is not going to be that great, but maybe it'll get them to the next step. And so um, I think there's all sorts of ways that we can try to use the public or try to use popular culture to reach the public with film viewings and discussions and things like that, too. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure how those uh, parents of that student felt, John, but um, I am the product of a medical family. My dad was a doctor, a multi-generation of mm -hmm. doctors and nurses, and um, they took us to historic sites and cultural places on every single family trip. Wow. For a long time, I thought I wanted to be, you know, in medicine, but I had great history teachers in high school that yeah. turned me on to the idea of that as a profession. So. Um, you know, it's, I think it's one of those things where history is cross-disciplinary. A lot of times we think yeah. about it as its own separate discipline. Um, but I, you know, fell hugely in love with medical history for a while because it's mm. so fascinating too. Um, so I also want to point out that John is on Twitter. So if you are, any of you are on Twitter, you should be following him because he is a Twitter historian. And a lot of the work on the front lines, I would say, is happening on Twitter right now too, with making sure that, um, you know, uh, quality history is being kind of put out there and a lot of those myths are being debunked. Yeah. Um, and on, on the point about, uh, about that, hang on a second, we have a question on what ways do you sort out the myths or falsities around Abraham Lincoln history versus what you determine to be true? Um, and this is, a, this is a big topic right now in terms of how you sort misinformation and disinformation. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of historical disinformation um, you know, things like the lost cause narrative, even that yeah. have just persisted for, you know, a, a, over a century. Um, so how do you sort out myth uh, and misinformation from the past and determine what is or isn't accurate? It's a great question. And actually, we're, we're going to be doing a session on that at the Lincoln Forum in November that I'll be part of with Walter Starr and Ed Steers. Um, it's hard with Lincoln because so much of what we know about Lincoln is based on reminiscences that were written anywhere from a day after the person met Lincoln to 50 years after the person met Lincoln. And, you know, you have to kind of wonder if 30 years after the fact, they write down 10 pages of a conversation with Lincoln. Lincoln said this, and then I said this, and then Abe said this, and then Mary walked in and she said this, you know, you have to wonder how accurate that is. And um, that's, how I think a lot of the myths emerge about Lincoln because they come from reminiscences. And so um, as a historian, I try to, uh, we try to find ways to corroborate evidence. And so um, it, it's a never ending battle though. And so with the dreams, with Lincoln's dreams, you know, I, I was writing this book and I wanted to have a chapter on Lincoln. And I knew the Gideon Wells account of the ship dream, but I didn't know about the other three accounts until I did a lot of digging and found them and they corroborated it for me. And then I wanted to know about this White House funeral dream. And I thought, well, everyone cites Ward Hill Lamon, 1893, 1895. And so I, that was my starting point. Now, here's the thing, being a historian now is a wonderful time because we have so many digital resources. Mm -hmm. So in that case, what I did was I took Lamon's account and I took phrases out of it and I searched on Google, I searched on Google Books and I searched on newspaper databases. And that's how I was able to find the earlier accounts uh, and, and I was able to then trace the evolution from before Lamon was in the story till Lamon puts himself in the middle of the story. And, um, and so I think a lot of the, the, the work is just heavy lifting of digging into the records or um, doing, you know, a lot of searches and targeted searches and broad searches. Um, so that you, one, I will say this, one of the problems with searching, like keyword searching on the internet, is that you can find anything. And so you have to, when you're trying to do historical research, you have to be very careful that you don't say, well, okay, I'm gonna keyword search for something. And then you find it and you say, okay, well, 
I was right, and that's what it is. It's important to always look for more context and uh, and corroborating evidence. And so I think, um, you know, with Lincoln, there's always going to be new things we discover and new evidence that maybe causes us to rethink old thoughts about what we thought we knew about Lincoln. Um, and there's always going to be some things that we just don't agree about too, because there's going to be, there's going to be sources that some people believe, you know, some people love Herndon and some people hate Herndon and, and that's going to make a difference on how you interpret Mary Todd Lincoln. Right. And so <laughs> and how Mary Todd Lincoln interprets Herndon. You know? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, and so uh, I think, I think the most important thing is to try to be intellectually honest in your research and your writing and to put evidence out there that maybe doesn't always support your view and to try to explain it um, and to not conceal things that don't support your view. Um, that's, I think, the best way we can try to get at the truth, as it were, about Lincoln or any other historical figure. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think, you know, sometimes we also have to wrestle with the fact that there's going to be gray area because, and this, this came up earlier in our conversation, you might have a reminiscence or oral history where, you know, it's not 100% accurate, but the, the overarching idea is true or the sentiment is right. true or the emotion is true and that we can't just toss something out wholesale because pieces of it are inaccurate because in fact, it might be offering really important critical context that is authentic evidence in a way. Yeah. Um, so this is a follow-up question to that we have from another guest tonight who said, have you noticed your students seeking truth versus sensationalism, um, particularly in research with the internet and with media? Um, and, you know, they, they comment that Lincoln would be appalled at the acceptance of blatant lies that are perpetuated. So you could, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in your students about this you know, are they showing a keen interest in, in seeking and understanding truth or are they sort of caught up in some of the sensationalism? Um, that's an interesting question. I, you know, I think there's something about, I don't know if it's in how high school education is being done. I think there's a strong push among students to tell me what I need to know. And whether that, I guess that's pursuing the truth, but for them, it's, tell me what I need to know for the test or tell me what I need to know for the assignment or for the career or what have you. And so to that extent, I think, yeah, I mean, they're, they're pursuing truth. And I find that my students don't seem to get caught up in a lot of sensationalism. Um, I mean, I think we all do to some extent, it's easy to see something on social media and have a instant reaction to it. And then maybe you find out later, Oh, that wasn't true. So we can all we can all easily be deceived, um, young and old. Uh, but no, I, I think my students that I have in class tend to be pretty level headed, and um, they they want to you know they want to have a good understanding of the subject matter for the class. Yeah. Part of it is so that they get a good grade. But what's encouraging to me is, you know, when I get emails from students years later who say, um, you know, I remember taking this class with you eight years ago and you talked about this and I just was at a museum and saw this and it made me think of your class. And I get those emails a couple times a year. Um, and so it's encouraging to, to know that students do that. Yeah, as a follow-up question from me on that, John, how, how much do students seem focused on the content versus the process of history? Well, since I'm not in, since I'm in an American studies American program history. and not in the history program, I never get to teach the methods class, which I would love to do at some point and teach them the process of um, doing historical research. But when I'm able, I, I do bring into my lectures discussion of um, how we know what we know. Mm -hmm. So about two weeks ago, I did a lecture on esp Soviet espionage in the United States during the Cold War. I teach a class called Treason in America, and we look at nefarious scoundrels from Jamestown to the present. It's a really fun class. And so we spend a month on the Civil War. We spend about a month on World War II and the Cold War. And in this one particular lecture, I, I try to get them to understand how what we know about Soviet espionage has evolved from the 1940s to today as different records become available. And they are just fascinated by, you know, how it is that we know what we know. 
um, mm. about that particular topic. And I do that to some extent with Lincoln, um, but it is more straightforward. It's not as exciting as Soviet espionage. So, um, <laughs> but I, I think they're interested to, to learn how to um, do historical research when I have the opportunities to show them. And what I tend to do is I find students who are really interested and really talented. And every summer, when the National Archives is open, I take a group of students to the National Archives and to the Library of Congress and teach them how to do research there. Mm. And then we take what they have come up with and come back to campus. And then I mentor them in writing an article about it. And so in the Lincoln Forum Bulletin, I've published a number of articles and then they've published in Ohio Valley History and Military Images and Civil War Navy and a whole bunch of different magazines. And it's it's research that they've been able to do on their own and, and then write about it. And that's, for me, that's a lot of fun too, to get to see them kind of doing the detective work of history and then processing the information and figuring out what it means. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and then your comment on treason and espionage is, is probably a good segue to talk about another sort of, uh, you know, body of your work, which is focused on federal judicial law. Mm -hmm. um, and you, in particular, you have the, the case on uh, Ex parte Merriman and, and Ex parte Milligan as well. Yeah. So can you, and let's, starting with the Merriman case, um, focusing on the president's power to suspend the writ of habeas corpus during a national emergency. One of the aspects of that case that has always fascinated me is the idea that the American legal system at that time, still in the 19th century, was very heavily influenced um, and, and drew guidance on precedent from Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'd like you to comment on that a little bit. Was Lincoln acting within accepted interpretations of the law? And mm -hmm. how has that, how was that case viewed in Lincoln's time? And, and can you talk a little bit about the legacy of Merriman? Yeah, so in the 1850s, Lincoln wrote to several young men who wanted to study with him and become lawyers. And he said, well, the way to do it is to get the books. And he said, get Blackstone's commentaries, get Chitty's pleadings and a couple other titles. And that's how you became a lawyer. I mean, Lincoln very famously in New Salem read Blackstone. He would lay on his back with his feet on a tree. And according to the reminiscences, although there are several who saw this, so I think it's true. Um, as the sun went through the sky, he would move around the tree so that he stayed in the shade. Um, Everyone who was a lawyer then read Blackstone. And, uh, you know, so the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus was really controversial, obviously, it still is. And part of the reason for the controversy is that the suspension clause is in Article One, Section 9 of the Constitution. And most of Article One has to do with the powers of Congress. But Article One, Section 9 is not solely about the powers of Congress. And Article One, Section 10 is about the powers of the states. And so Lincoln's view was the Constitution is silent as to who has this power. The Constitution says the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. And Lincoln said, I have a case of rebellion on my hands. The Constitution's silent as to who can do it. It just says uh, when, it doesn't say where, so I can do it anywhere. And so he, he took that power. And, and not only did he exercise that power, he delegated it to his generals, which I think is maybe a little uh, too far. A bridge too far. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, the legal community was divided. The Republican, most Republicans, I think, tended to support him in that Edward Bates, his attorney general, writes an opinion at Lincoln's request supporting it. Horace Binney, a great Philadelphia lawyer, writes a pamphlet supporting it. The Democrats oppose it. Roger Tawney, very famously in Ex parte Merriman, says it's unconstitutional. Um, I think the history of the Constitution is ambiguous. So that clause of the Constitution was originally in the clause having to do with the powers of the courts. And then the Committee on Style moved it to Article 1, Section 9. And so I think Lincoln could make a plausible case that this was a federal power and it wasn't necessarily a congressional one. That said, the judgment of history has been that it's a, a legislative power and that Congress is the one who should exercise that power. And so in 1863, Congress then does pass a law authorizing Lincoln to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. But one of the things I write about in the book is that 
Lincoln signs that law into signs that bill into law and then very promptly ignores it and just does kind of whatever he wants to do on this matter anyway. Yeah. Um, maybe a, a key to Lincoln's presidency too is how he uh, communicated with the public um, mm -hmm. or and communicated sometimes through newspapers to the public. And David Kent had a follow-up question uh, that's relevant here where he says, as corollary, can you talk about how Lincoln communicated to the public and managed public sentiment? Sure. Public sentiment was very important to Lincoln. In the Lincoln-Douglas debates, Lincoln said, public sentiment is everything. He, he who shapes public sentiment does more than he who passes statutes or enacts laws. He makes those things possible. And I think for Lincoln, he is always thinking about how can I shape public sentiment? How can I get the public to come along with my view? Um, and so he did it through public letters, very famously public letter to Horace Greeley on emancipation or to Albert Hodges on emancipation. And regarding um, the writ of habeas corpus, he does it in the Corning letter. So uh, very famous former Congressman from Ohio, Clement Blanningham gets arrested and tried before a military tribunal in May of 1863. It leads to a massive protest movement by Democrats. There's a rally of 25,000 Democrats in Independence Hall. There's a huge rally in Albany, New York and another one in uh, Cincinnati. And the Cincinnati and the New York Democrats then write resolutions that they send to Lincoln saying, you're violating the constitution. And Lincoln uses those as opportunities to send responses, but he doesn't do it privately. He publishes those letters and they become, they're not only in the newspapers, but they get published as pamphlets. And it's his way of saying, here's my position. And then he broadcasts it to the nation as a whole. And if you look at the, the habeas corpus issue today, anyone who reads about Lincoln reads the Corning letter. They read his letter to Corning. No one anymore reads the letters that Erastus Corning yeah. sent to Lincoln or that Matthew Burchard sent to Lincoln from Ohio. I actually require my students to read all of them. And it's long, it's a long set of readings and they may resent me for it, I don't know, but it's worth it. And I, I'll be honest, I actually think the Democrats have the far better argument in, in their letters to Lincoln than Lincoln does to them. Um, and so for those who haven't read it, shoot me an email, I'll send you a PDF. I won't give you the quiz that comes afterwards. Um, but it, it's really incredible to see the way that they're arguing over real issues, constitutional and political issues that have very tangible effects on civilians who are being arrested and, and are still really quite relevant today. I mean, in the war on terror, as our nation has debated what to yeah. do with suspected terrorists, do you do military tribunals in Guantanamo Bay? We've debated issues similar to this in the past, and I think the, the arguments are relevant. And it's little wonder that Lincoln and Merriman and Milligan get cited by the Supreme Court even in the last 10 or 15 years. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It, it, in many ways, it often feels like and uh, the, the judicial branch is just operating in a different timeline um, than mm -hmm. a lot of other politics because it is, it's taking the long view of a lot of things. Um, we have a few more questions here, but we also only have a couple minutes left. So um, I'm just gonna go with the first one that I see here. And it's of, of your many books, can you identify one or two where you feel you learned the most or uncovered facts that had not been previously explored by other historians? the most? I'd like to say all of them. Um, that, you know, with all of them, I, I try to write things that people have missed before. And so with the Merriman book, I never set out to write that book. Mm -hmm. When I was doing my, my doctoral dissertation was on treason in the North during the Civil War. And in the process of doing that research, I found a letter that John Merriman wrote describing why he had burned railroad bridges north of Baltimore in April of 1861. And I found that letter in 2006, and I did nothing with it. And then in 2009, I was invited to a, a Lincoln conference, and I met Matthew Pinksker there. And um, I told him about this letter, and he said, oh, you've got to write something about it. So I went home, and I... Um, I transcribed the letter and I wrote a four page little introduction explaining the Merriman case. And I thought I'll just publish this as a journal article, like a little note on a document. 
And I sent it to Mark Neely, Pulitzer Prize winning historian, my mentor at Penn State. And I said, Mark, what do you think of this? And he said, this is really important, but you're not doing it justice. That was October of 2009. Between then and Christmas day, I drove all over the East Coast and uh, ended up writing 43 pages based on a whole lot of new research that I did at, in Annapolis and Baltimore and Washington and Harrisburg. And I sent it back to Neely, I think on Christmas day in 2009. And he read it and he said, this is really good, but you've got two different things going on here. You need to either um, it, cut it into two articles or expand it into a book. And I thought, well, I'd rather have a book than two articles. And that spring of 2010, I developed my class on treason. And so I like to say I was doing nothing but think about treason that year. I was researching, <laughs> writing and teaching treason. And I finished writing the book in July and I was able to completely change the way we thought about the Merriman case because of archival records that I had looked at. Most people, when they write about legal and constitutional history, they only look at published case reports. And one of the big points I try to make in that book is we need to look at archival records in legal history too. Um, yeah. The other things that have really jumped out at me, I mean, I try to write books that uh, they often come to me when I find a new source. So with dreams, I never would have envisioned writing a history of dreams, but I read Founding Brothers, a great book about the founding era. And Joseph J. Ellis writes about how Jefferson and Adams were describing their dreams to one another as they were reconciling their friendship. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to write a history of the Civil War through the dreams of the people who lived through it? Um, while I was writing that book, I did another book on politics and the election of 1864 and how soldiers viewed emancipation in Lincoln. And so as I was digging sources for that and reading soldiers letters, anytime I found a dream, I tucked it away in a folder and, and saved it for a rainy day. And so, um, you know, each of the books I hope offers something new and different that hasn't come out in other histories. Um, I don't envision myself ever writing a biography of Lincoln. I think it's great that people want to do that. And I, I would probably sell a lot more books if I did. Uh, but for me, I want to I want to try to find sources and questions that are maybe a little quirky or a little bit different. But those are the ones that I think are most interesting. And we so appreciate it. Um... So we're winding down now, John. Um, will you please just let everyone also know you've brought up Lincoln Forum a few times. Yeah. And I also serve on the Lincoln Forum yeah. board um, with John, which is an honor and a privilege to do. Um, and the Lincoln Forum is, is coming up in November. Can you just let folks know where they can find out more about that? And then Jamie will kick it back to you to close things up. Sure. So we will be uh, meeting in Gettysburg in November. It's going to be a wonderful event. Jay Unger is going to be there. Do you know if you want to hear a show and farewell live? We're going to have incredible speakers: Alan Gelzo, James Oakes, Harold Holzer, Annette Gordon Reed, um, Walter Starr, a whole bunch of people. Aaron, you and I will be on a panel together talking about Lincoln Springfield with with some other great folks. Um, people who are interested in, in learning about it can go to our website, and I want to make sure that I get the website right. It's thelincolnforum.org, so thelincolnforum.org, and you can get membership information there, and also um, if you join, you get our bulletin, and then you can attend the symposium. And if I can say this too, on Saturday, this coming Saturday, May 15th, at 2 p.m., Eastern time. We're going to be doing a special Zoom symposium that we're going to live stream at our Facebook page. So if you just go to Facebook and search for the Lincoln Forum on Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern, it'll be Ron White and Richard Striner talking about their recent books. Excellent. Thanks so much, John. Jamie, back to you. Thank you guys both so much for the discussion. John, uh, thank you for sharing your obvious passion about history. Um, if you wouldn't mind telling people how they can get and keep in touch with you and where they can purchase your books from. Oh, sure. Um, I have a website, jonathanwhite.org. I couldn't get .com at the time, so I'm an org. And then I'm on Twitter. It's at Civil War John, and I should specify it's J-O-N. There's no H in that. And then uh, if you search for me and CNU where I teach, you can find my email address and I'm always happy to correspond that way too. Perfect, that sounds great. We can also put that out on our Facebook to um, encourage people to reach out if they have further questions. We weren't able to get to all of them today because there's so such a great content and um, information. So 
Also just uh, letting everybody else know we're coming into our summer season. So you'll notice that our webinar schedule is gonna lighten up a little bit, uh, but we do have one more scheduled in June, um, June 2nd right now. And just keep an eye out on our website, emails and Facebook for future events. Uh, we encourage everyone to enjoy their summer evenings with family and friends in a safe way, of course, but keep learning and keep reading and sending us ideas for future webinars as well. And as you close out the webinar tonight, there will be a short survey. Of course, please take that. It helps us to improve our offerings and again, gives us the ideas that you want to see in the future and helps us continue our programming. So, and as always, I like to give a shout out to our members and volunteers out there in the audience tonight. You truly are always the backbone of our organization and we can't say thank you enough. And we'd also like to invite you to make a contribution to the foundation tonight. Uh, you can go to our website, www.alplm.org. This helps us to keep the Lincoln legacy alive. Again, thank you, John. Thank you, Aaron, for the great discussion tonight. And everyone have a good night. Thank you.